For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. You are on Strat News Global. I'm Nitin Gokhale. This week, we are doing a special series, Galwan, one year on. That's one year after the horrific clash between Indian and Chinese soldiers up there in Ladakh, in the mountains, uh, in the eastern Ladakh uh, line of actual control between India and China. Since then, many things have developed, many things have happened, negotiations have happened and a partial disengagement has taken place uh, at some places along the line of actual control between India and China in Eastern Ladakh. But tensions have not abated and China's aggressive behavior elsewhere across the globe, uh, whether with the US or uh, Europe or in South China Sea, doesn't seem to uh, slow down at all. It seems that China has decided it wants to take on the world, whether it's ready, whether it's uh, going to end up in something uh, that we don't know or can't predict. To discuss all that, I have a very special guest with me, joining me uh, from the United States, uh, old friend Gordon G. Chang, uh, a China, a long-time China observer, author, analyst, and of course, someone who has very strong views on the authoritarian Chinese regime. Uh, Gordon, welcome to this program. Oh, well, thank you so much, Nitin. Uh, well, uh, Gordon, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the uh, Chinese uh, aggression or uh, belligerent behavior, not only with India, but uh, elsewhere in South China Sea or otherwise, uh, doesn't seem to uh, slow down uh, despite uh, the pandemic or maybe because of the pandemic. So uh, how do you see the Chinese uh, you know, looking at uh, international relations right now? What are their priorities? What is their foreign policy based on uh, your opening thoughts? As you pointed out, China is taking on everybody at the same time. And, and this is really worrisome because this shows uh, it's not being strategic. When a country is not being strategic, when it undercuts its own interest, you know something is wrong at the center of their politics. And I think that's what it shows right now. We don't know exactly what's going on in Beijing, but we can be sure that there is certainly very troublesome developments. Because not only are Chinese soldiers deep into Indian-controlled territory, we know that China is flying into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. We have Chinese ships circling around Taiwan. The Chinese ships are going into Japanese territorial water in the East China Sea, the Senkakus. Um, China is pushing out everywhere, and so we've got to be extremely concerned. Indeed. In fact, uh, just one small uh, clarification, Gordon. Uh, after last year's uh, standoff in Ladakh, in January, there was this uh, partial disengagement that happened in, at this uh, area called Finger 4, Finger 8, and on the south bank of Pangang, so along the Kailash range. Since then, uh, the, uh, the disengagement in other friction points like Gogra, Hot Springs, Depsang, and all that has uh, not proceeded uh, anymore. Uh, what was expected on the lines of what was expected. But the fact is uh, that uh, at least they're not uh, eyeball to eyeball. But uh, the uh, thought process in India and elsewhere is that China actually wants to first sort out Taiwan rather than uh, India because uh, when they brought in 60,000 soldiers uh, on the line of actual control, it was meant to be a military coercion rather than an all-out war or at least an offensive against India. Uh, your thoughts on uh, whether uh, Taiwan is uh, right now the big target uh, for China because all the noises from there, all the statements from uh, Beijing seem to be uh, sort of indicating uh, that possibility. Well, well, certainly China is pressuring Taiwan, but they're pressuring other countries as well. We have learned recently, for instance, that there are Chinese settlements that have encroached into Nepal, into India's Sikkim. And despite the partial in disengagement in Ladakh, um, Chinese soldiers are still in territory that India considers to be its own. So um, 
Yes, uh, at any one particular day, it might be Taiwan that is the end of the point of the sharp object from Beijing. But other days, it's it's other countries as well. And and it varies. Um, And this is really quite worrisome because it shows that China is probing everywhere at the same time. And um, we don't know really what their long-term strategy is, except, of course, to break apart their neighbors. But at any one particular moment, they seem to be going after everyone. But why is that? I mean, do you have any uh, clear, uh, any clarity on that? Is it that it born out of this kind of attitude is born out of insecurity or inner party struggle in China? What's your guess? Well, my guess is that, first of all, it does show insecurity on the part of Xi Jinping. Um, He's taking a tough position because I think he doesn't want to leave his flanks exposed. Um, He knows that a lot of people are out for him. And although it does look like he has almost absolute power, we know that there are groups in the Chinese political system that are opposed to him because they've taken away power, money um, from them, and they want to get it back. So there is this infighting. Um, And I think that that's partly to explain why China is particularly belligerent right now. Um, So um, it is a very unpredictable system. And just one other thing, and that is we know that from the very beginning of Xi Jinping's rule, he made certain flag officers, certain generals and certain admirals, the core of his political support. And I think that they are pushing him in a very difficult direction. Now, I think he's an aggressor on his own, but nonetheless, you have the uh, Chinese military um, backing up his very aggressive vision for China. What about uh, China and the United States relations? Under uh, uh, President Biden, uh, is it anything different? Uh, do you discern uh, any new uh, direction that uh, the U.S. administration is taking or is it going soft on China? What's the, your assessment of the first six months now or five, five and a half months? Yeah. Biden seems to be continuing most, but not all, of President Trump's policies toward China. And there have been some distressing things the Biden administration has done. So, for instance, in recent days, we have seen Biden uh, lift the ban on TikTok and WeChat. Um, President Trump tried to ban them. Um, The Biden administration is going back on that. Um, So that's not good. Uh, And that shows that I think a failure of political will. The great thing that India did was to ban TikTok. That certainly hurt the Chinese app, and it also hurt China itself. So India has shown some very um, resolute measures. And I wish my country would be as strong as India was in that regard. Well, I'm sure they could take some cue because India has also uh, barred uh, Huawei from uh, participating in the trials for 5G, for instance. And that has uh, created uh, some kind of discomfort in uh, Beijing. They have issued statements that this is not a good practice. Uh, but I think India has also decided, uh, as you are aware, uh, statements have been made by India's external affairs minister, uh, amongst others, that uh, the uh, tension on the border cannot be uh, delinked from uh, the overall relationship, whereas the Chinese want to put uh, the uh, border issue on the back burner or uh, on the side and uh, discuss other issues. Uh, Is India's attitude uh, something that uh, the uh, world uh, looks at, um, either uh, grudgingly uh, accepting India's uh, stand, or what's what's the uh, thought uh, across the globe, or even amongst analysts like you? Uh, Has India done well, or has India wants to do more, uh, should do more? Well, I think it's both. I think India has done well in terms of cutting links with Huawei, as you point out, with WeChat, with the 259 other Chinese apps. So that's a good thing. Um, But China, you know, I I think China understands that uh, it can still get what it wants from India. You know, we've heard the Chinese ambassador on, I think it was the 8th of this month, talk to um, India um, and basically said, well, let's put this aside because the border, we can just sort of put it over there and we can go on and have good relations. Well, no, you can't. When you have uh, invaders' troops uh, on your soil, you can't have good relations with them. And I hope that Modi won't fall for that. Um, You know, I'd like to see Modi do more. I can understand why he's not. But nonetheless, um, right now, India has to understand that China is an enemy. It wants to break apart India. 
Um, it is, I mentioned in Sikkim, it's in Ladakh, and uh, you can't have good relations when they are trying to take your territory. Indeed, in fact, uh, China is also confronting and pressurizing tiny Bhutan, uh, which is uh, more or less uh, India's uh, greatest and uh, strongest uh, friend uh, in the region. It also has uh, security uh, considerations tied up with India, as you know, happened what happened in Dokulam in 2017. But like you said, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, has a difficult choice uh, given the, that the pandemic has also ravaged the economy. Uh, it's not in good shape. Uh, and yet, uh, India has to stand up to China. Uh, in fact, as we speak this month, uh, exactly uh, 35 years ago, there was a similar uh, but a smaller confrontation in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, in Sundarang Chu and Wangdung area, uh, where uh, India had again taken a tough stand uh, that time. And uh, it took almost nine years to resolve, uh, at least the uh, clarifying the line. Uh, so India does have that experience, but uh, how do uh, other countries like Australia, Japan, United States, especially the Quad um, grouping, how can they help India? I mean, what's your thought on that? Well, I think it's been very good. We've seen uh, Quad members exercise together their militaries, um, and we need to see more of that. Um, and I think we need to see uh, statements from the United States um, really talking about the Quad. I, it was very good that President Biden participated in that quad meeting, that virtual quad meeting. I'd like to see um, the leaders of the four countries actually meet in person. That would be a strong signal to Beijing that uh, the quad is going to work together. And of course, it's not just the quad. You have countries like Vietnam, like Taiwan, um, I think that could also participate. You got to remember that China is pressuring all of these countries. So they all have a common interest because they have a common enemy. And that realization, I think, needs to be operationalized even more than it is now. There have been some very good steps, but more needs to be done. Indeed. In fact, uh, is uh, trade a good weapon to use against uh, China, uh, sort of uh, controlling their uh, trade practices or uh, controlling their uh, trade inflows? into other countries. Uh, Australia tried that uh, for a bit, but it didn't sort of uh, go uh, much further. In fact, uh, there seems to be some kind of a thaw between China and Australia. So what is what are the levers that uh, countries uh, like the Quad plus three, you know, New Zealand, South Korea and Vietnam can use against China? There is an attempt, but you must be having some thoughts on that also. Well, we have to view that in the context of the world's relations with China right now, which I think are changing. And they're changing because more and more countries are starting to understand that the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, the pathogen causing this disease, looks like it leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And that is changing countries' perceptions of China. It's darkening relationships. And that means these countries now, I think, are starting to see more of a motive and incentive to work together. Also, there's, there's another thing that's occurring, which is separate and apart from this. And that is China's, they call it wolf warrior diplomacy, whatever you want to call it. Beijing is overstepping and it's forcing countries to take a more resolute position. So just for instance, in December of last year, um, Beijing and the European Union announced uh, the comprehensive agreement on investment. And guess what? Just a couple of weeks ago, the European Parliament put implementation of that very important deal on hold. And they did that because China was sanctioning EU parliamentarians and officials. Um, and this was over um, Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, genocide and, and crimes against humanity. And that really is forcing countries, I think, to take a different attitude about China. So, you know, with these China-India relations, um, they see... I think we have to look at them in the context of things that are going on in the rest of the world. And those big trends, I believe, are in New Delhi's favor. Indeed, I think New Delhi has to ride that wave, the new trend, as you mentioned. And uh, therefore, there has to be a concerted effort with uh, most of the other countries that you mentioned. Even Europe has uh, now showed some spine and uh, put on hold uh, the Comprehensive uh, Investment Treaty. Uh, also, uh, in, inside China, uh, and as we just briefly uh, touched upon that uh, in the previous questions, uh, there's power struggle. We don't know whether there's power struggle or not. But uh, 
I mean, you know, a lot of people uh, don't understand, unlike you, that uh, China or Chinese system is not a monolith. It's not, uh, despite what Xi Jinping might think or uh, might behave, uh, like a supreme leader, uh, he, there will be a pushback, isn't it, uh, inside China, inside other uh, arms of the government and the party. Uh, what, what's the uh, what's the sense you get, or uh, you know, your reading about what might happen uh, to Xi Jinping or, or, or the power struggle there? Yeah, I think that um, Xi Jinping faces a problem right now, and that they made a big deal about how China's response to the coronavirus was superior to that of America, to Europe, uh, to India. But what's happened is we now have this outbreak in um, Guangzhou, the big port city in the south. And I don't, I don't really think the Chinese have been able to solve this. Um, I believe that no society will recover from coronavirus fully until it has an effective and safe vaccine. Now, China has five vaccines, but uh, they haven't been proven safe and they're not particularly effective. Uh, so I think China's going to struggle with coronavirus for years to come. The U.S. has three good vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. And uh, the U.S. is basically going to um, give doses to countries around the world so they can recover. That really puts China in a pretty difficult position because I think that they're going to struggle um, and continue to struggle because they just don't have the vaccines to be able to um, make sure their society fully recovers. So uh, that, will that affect uh, Xi Jinping's uh, standing or will there be uh, more uh, uh, people emboldened to take him on? Uh, like I was mentioning about the inner party struggle or maybe pushback against Xi Jinping's uh, concentration of power? I tend to think so, Nitin. And the reason is that because China can't get past COVID-19, its economy is going to struggle. Now, China's economy has done okay, not as well as Beijing reports, but um, they've been able to sell a lot of stuff around the world, personal protective equipment and others, and they've been able to incur debt and to engage in more stimulus spending. But the core of the Chinese economy that they tell us is consumption, and consumption has been very, very soft certainly not as good as Beijing has reported. And that means, um, you know, they, they, I think they're going to have a really hard time on the economy. And with a very soft economy, it really means that there's going to be um, problems throughout China because the Communist Party has based its legitimacy on the continual delivery of prosperity. And they're not going to be able to deliver prosperity for quite some time. So I think Xi Jinping has got to be very concerned which means he's probably going to be pretty belligerent because the way out of a domestic crisis is to cause a foreign one. Indeed. Uh, so one last question and one thought from you, Gordon. Uh, I know you tweet at uh, Gordon G. Chang, uh, which our viewers will also see uh, on the bottom of the screen uh, as we uh, broadcast this program. But uh, one last thought from you about uh, China's recent decision to allow uh, couples to have a third child from a second child to a third child within five years. It's clearly there's some crisis brewing, a population crisis there. Uh, certainly. China is uh, on track to suffer the worst demographic collapse in history in the absence of war or disease. They claim 1.41 billion people as of the end of last year. But we know that with a total fertility rate of 1.3, which is probably 1.0. That's the number of children per female of China of childbearing age. China is on track to lose maybe a billion people in between now and the end of the century. That means that China is going to be at 2100. It's probably going to be about as populous as my country, the United States. Um, you know, probably India right now is my guess. My guess is that India is the world's most populous society. This is the first time in at least 300 years, and maybe even all of recorded history, that China is not the world's most populous nation. And this is going to affect the Chinese, um, their mentality, the way they think about it. Because I know I come from a Chinese family, and we take great pride in being the world's biggest tribe. Well, True. that's... 
That's probably not true today, but in a couple of years, it will be blindingly obvious to everybody that India's got more people. India has an almost perfect demographic profile of a very young, very vibrant society. China is going to get old. It's going to suffer this very sharp decline in demography. They won't be able to intimidate everybody. But that's the reason why I worry about China now, because I think Xi Jinping looks around and says, well, I can't intimidate the U.S. I can't intimidate India. You know, what am I going to do? So I think he's going to cause a problem somewhere. Indeed, I think and on that note, uh, I, we've actually uh, summar you actually summarized the uh, problem that China faces and the world uh, as a consequence faces because Xi Jinping uh, will try and divert attention from the domestic problems that he faces at, on multiple fronts, economy, population, declining, uh, maybe GDP, all that. But uh, thanks, Gordon, for your insightful thoughts. As always, uh, a pleasure to speak to you. You are on this special program, the special series, Galwan, one year on. And uh, of course, we will uh, keep inviting you. And it's always be our pleasure to uh, get your thoughts on Strat News Global. Thanks for your time and thanks for your thoughts. Oh, well, thank you so much, Nitin. I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you. Pleasure. So viewers, uh, do uh, keep watching uh, Strat News Global. Keep sending feedback. As you see, uh, we uh, bring in specialists and uh, commentators who have uh, in-depth knowledge of China and uh, the relations uh, the world has with China. So do keep watching. Uh, do uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, you know where to reach us through our social media handles. They're all there on the screen. So do keep watching. And uh, until the next time, it's goodbye.